Today I'd like to welcome you to the Rower Research Station where we're going to talk about some of our long-term ongoing cover crop research trials. So here at the station we've been looking at a continuous soybean cover crop no-till rotation for about six years. And what we want to highlight is how cover crops can fit into your soybean production system. And we also want to discuss the potential benefits from the cover crops as well as the no-till production uh, type of tillage approach that we want to incorporate in conjunction with those cover crops. So first off, we really want to emphasize this idea that in order to get the benefits out of cover crops, you really need to also consider or implement no tillage production practices at the same time. So when we think about cover crops and the benefits that they bring to a production system, they're usually associated with increases in soil organic matter, increases in surface coverage due to biomass and residues, and we can't really achieve those without implementing those no-till production practices. So really they have to go hand in hand. You know, if you're going to take the time to plant and spend the money incorporating a cover crop, you really also need to do no-till so that you can fully realize the benefits of those cover crops. So now when we shift over and we think about, okay, well, why are we growing cover crops? There are a lot of different potential reasons as to why a producer might be interested in cover crops. But the first thing, and one particular scenario that I think is important to understand is we need to have goal-oriented reasoning for implementing cover crops. So a lot of times when we think about a particular cash crop rotation, we have a specific reason for why we're planting corn, or we have a specific reason as to why we're planting rice in a particular field for a given year. And unfortunately, a lot of times producers don't use that same approach when they're planting cover crops. And we really need to have that goal-oriented approach in order to be successful. And so what do I mean by a goal-oriented approach? There are a lot of things that cover crops can do for our production system, and if we realize those and develop our cover crop implementation strategy around those goals, it's going to help us be successful in the long run. Some of the benefits we see from cover crops have to do with the biomass that's produced and left on the surface. And so if we think about things like weed suppression, uh, preventing crusting, um, increasing you know, water infiltration and retention within the soil, those are all things that you know, are the direct result of leaving the biomass of the cover crop on the soil surface to protect it from rainfall events or even irrigation events. But then if we think about the below ground benefits of cover crops, it's still going to be related to that biomass production, but it's going to be more associated with the soil biological and physical as well as chemical characteristics. And so some of the benefits that cover crops can bring there are increased aggregation, increased soil structure, which leads to obviously increased water holding retention and capacity, but also increased infiltration rates. And then when we switch over to the chemistry or the nutrient side of it, increasing organic matter or implementing cover crops can help uh, result in net additions of nutrients to the soil, such as nitrogen through the use of legumes. Um, the increase in soil organic matter in the soil can also help increase nutrient retention capacity. So that's another benefit in the chemical characteristic. And then if we think about having living roots year round and the impact that it results in for the biological community in the soil, it can be very substantial. And having those living roots helps support, you know, a microbial community, which is the, the biological component of the soil. And that's gonna aid in, you know, we'll say disease suppression, it can aid in nutrient cycling and retention. There are a lot of benefits that we can get out of that. And so when we know all these, you know, potential outcomes of utilizing cover crops, then we can start to pick and choose what we want to get in our particular specific production system. And we need to start with our cash crop. And so depending on the cash crop we're planting, those goals or the desired outcomes of the cover crop may change. So for instance, if I'm planting soybean, 
Chances are the types of things I would like to get out of my cover crop are going to revolve around weed suppression, erosion prevention, and then things like increased water retention or infiltration. And so when I know those desired benefits for my soybean cash crop and the desired outcomes of my uh, cover crop, then I can select the appropriate cover crop to fit into that particular production system. And so when we think about that specific scenario, we're traditionally going to want a cover crop with high biomass and a biomass that remains on the surface for an extended period of time. And so what cover crops are going to fall into that category? Well, it's typically going to be a winter cereal cover crop with a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And the ones that are going to, you know, species that are going to fall into that category are going to be like cereal rye, black seeded oats, barley, and triticale. And so those ideally are going to fit those desired outcomes of the cover crop and provide those benefits to the soybean cash crop. If we shift gears a little bit and we start talking about a cash crop such as corn, rice, or cotton, then there are other potential benefits that we might want to garner, and those could include nitrogen credits from the cover crop, as well as those other things I mentioned like weed suppression, water retention, so on and so forth. And so if we do want to try to get nitrogen credits from our cover crop, then we need to switch our mindset a little bit and start thinking about implementing legumes into our cover crop, either mix or as a single species. And legumes are a little bit tricky because even though they can provide you know, substantial benefits to our crop rotation, the residue does not last very long on the surface because they have a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio. And depending on your previous crop and your soil texture, you may have a hard time getting them established and, and able to grow effectively. Um, the other caveat to growing legumes is the seed cost is usually a little bit higher, but the benefits you can get out with the nitrogen credits more often than not will cover the cost of that added um, cover crop seed when you're purchasing a legume. Some of the legumes that do very well in our Arkansas production systems are Austrian winter pea, hairy vetch, common or cahaba vetch, and then some of the clovers have mixed results here and there depending on the environment and the soil conditions when we're establishing those cover crops in the fall. So overall, that's just a general overview of some of the reasons why we want to incorporate cover crops into our production systems, you know, some of the benefits that we can see from that. And now I want to talk specifically about the results that we're seeing from this study here at the Rower Research Station. So as I mentioned before, this is a study that we've been conducting for about six years. During that time, it's been continuous no-till production, continuous soybean production, with various winter cover crop treatments included. And those treatments will include a winter fallow, where we just let you know, the native winter annual uh, vegetation grow. Then we have a cereal rye cover crop treatment that is just a single species uh, cereal rye winter cover crop. We have a black seeded oat treatment. We have a barley treatment. We have an Austrian winter pea treatment. In the past, we had a blue lupin treatment, which we recently removed from the study just because we could never get the blue lupin to establish and grow effectively in our environment or in our winter growing conditions. And so it was basically just another fallow treatment. So we felt, okay, let's switch that to a different legume that's better suited for our production system. And so this year uh, we've included hairy vetch, which you'll see is you know, much more vigorous and probably one of the better performing cover crops in this particular season. And then uh, we have a couple of mixes included. We have something called the soybean blend, which has been promote, uh, promoted specifically for soybean production systems. And it is a blend of cereal rye, uh, seven top turnip or some uh, mustard species, and then crimson clover. And then the last mix that we've included is a 50-50 blend of Austrian winter pea and black seeded oat. And I'm a little bit biased to that particular treatment uh, just because we've been looking at it for about 10 years and it routinely performs the best in our poorly drained, what I would consider rice soils in Eastern Arkansas. And regardless of the year, regardless of the establishment timing, 
It is a treatment that typically performs very well in terms of establishment and then spring growth prior to termination. And so once again, we can get benefits from all these different species or mixes, and it really just comes down to producer identifying which of those is going to fit best into his production system. So if we talk specifically about the results of this trial at this location, one thing that we've noticed is we get a significant increase in soybean yield anytime we plant cover crops, and that tends to be an accumulative effect over years. So early on in the study, years one, two, and three, the cover crop treatments were similar to slightly better yielding than the fallow treatment. But once we passed year uh, three of this continuous uh, research trial, we started to notice that the gap between the yield of the soybean following cover crops versus the fallow uh, started to be statistically significant, and year after year it continued to grow. Or now we're at the point where any of the soybeans following uh, winter cover crop treatment are yielding anywhere from 8 to 15 bushels per acre more than that fallow treatment. And so if you remember, the fallow treatment is simply a no-till treatment where we let the annual winter weeds grow. There's no cover crop specific treatment there. And so we do get the benefit, you know, probably of some no-till. But that gap between that fallow treatment and the cover, cover crop treatment really indicate you know, the potential benefits that we can get from implementing cover crops into that soybean production system. And so now if we shift our focus you know, just a little bit to the question of soil health, that's something that we've been measuring in these particular studies. And over time, we haven't noticed a significant change in the soil health amongst any of these treatments. And that's the fallow versus any of the cover crop treatments. And we start to see numerical differences. So what does that mean? Well, we start to see slight changes in the numbers, but statistically they're not different. And so from a scientific standpoint, we really can't say that those treatments are different. But there appears to be something going on there because we're getting higher soybean yield. And so what we're hoping to do as we continue this study going into the future is try to tease out those subtle differences um, where we have cover crops versus where we don't and how they're actually impacting and increasing soybean yield. Some of the things that we've noticed that we feel are contributing, uh, one, we do appear to get added weed suppression and weed control anywhere that we have the cover crops. So that provides a little bit of benefit and yield boost. Another thing that we noticed is increased infiltration, both from irrigation and precipitation events, which probably adds to yield. And then uh, added water infiltration, or sorry, uh, added water retention from the standpoint that the water we do get to infiltrate remains in the soil longer because we have less evaporative losses. And so even though we may not have a soil health measurement that picks up you know, differences amongst those treatments, we have these cumulative additive effects of each of these different components, whether it be weed suppression or increased water infiltration and retention that result in, like I said, anywhere from you know, eight to a 15 bushel per acre soybean yield difference. And so if we were just to summarize all this, you know, the idea is cover crops can be very beneficial for our Arkansas production systems, especially our soybean production systems. And they can be implemented with little to no added cost. And the reason for that is if you think about the potential cost of implementing a cover crop, it can be anywhere from 10 to 30 to $40 an acre, depending on the blend or the single species cover crop that you select. But the one thing that you have to remember is that if you want to successfully implement a cover crop, you should also implement no-till production practices. And if you think about the cost of labor, equipment depreciation, and then fuel charges associated with tillage, more often than not, our tillage practices in a soybean production system can equate from anywhere to $30 to $60 per acre. So if I'm able to remove tillage from my soybean production system, that gives me $30 to $60 per acre savings that I could then spend on a cover crop and a lot of times more than pay for the cover crop uh, seed, planting, and termination, and maybe even have you know, a few dollars left in my pocket just on the amount of savings associated with implementing that no-till production. So long story short, 
Cover crops are a great fit in our soybean production systems. I would encourage you to look into them if you haven't already. Consider planting cover crops on a small portion of your acreage. You know, kind of get your feet wet, figure out what works and what doesn't. You know, we would never recommend that you kind of go in whole hog and plant cover crops on your entire acreage, but you know, just kind of work up to it a little bit at a time. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, you know, we've been working with cover crops here in Arkansas for about uh, at least 10 to 12 years. So we've started, started to get all the kinks worked out and really know how to make it successful. As always, I would like to thank the Arkansas Soybean uh, Research and Promotion Board for funding um, all the research that I've talked about today. They've been very instrumental in helping us fund cover crop research to find out what works best in our production systems and help answer those questions that our producers are asking regarding successful cover crop implementation in an Arkansas soybean production system.